So now it's our good fortune to enjoy turning the mic on Mr. Tapper and to watch him be interviewed by our own Mark Updegrove. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. That was very nice. Howdy. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be here. So for many of you, you've, you've seen Jake here before. He came uh, here in 2018 to talk about his first work of fiction, The Hellfire Club. And so we're delighted to have you back. Now, a whole lot has happened since 2018. Well, there was a, there was a second book in between the first book and the third book, but I, there was no book tour because there was a mass global pandemic. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> anyway. So among the many things that have happened, including your second book. There was an insurrection also. I don't know. <laughs> the few, uh, sorry, go ahead. Not at all. Uh, Donald Trump is no longer president. Don't. Well, well. For now. It depends who you ask. <laughs> the there Eagles are, won the Super Bowl. The, right? That is true. Right. That was very exciting. But that, that had happened but, but when we, I was here last time. That happened in fe, uh, February 2018. Anyway. That's fair enough. Uh, you're right. Absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but big things. Many things have happened in the world. They were in the Super Bowl again. And they did not. But we don't have to talk yeah, about we that. Don't have to talk about that. <laughs> but this is not the crowd for that. Sorry. But your two books continue the story of the couple that you came here to talk about in, in 2018. Uh, Charlie and Margaret Martyr. Uh, first book, uh, Hellfire Club, I mentioned, introduces these characters. Charlie Martyr is a, is a World War II hero. Uh, he is a, a, a Columbia professor uh, and gets picked to, to fill a vacant seat in Congress and goes to McCarthy-era Washington with his zoologist wife, Margaret. You continue their story in your second book, uh, in early 1960s Washington during the Kennedy administration. And your latest book, All the Demons Are Here, follows their story into 1977 and is told from the perspective of their children, Ike and Lucy. Their adult children, yeah. Their adult children. And, tell, and tell us about Ike and Lucy. All, all of the books are really about um, America and all of the books are really about politics and, and culture today as seen through the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. Um, so Ike and Lucy are 20 and 22, and this latest book takes place in 1977. Ike is, he is disillusioned America. And in 1977, as probably some of the people here remember, post Watergate, post Vietnam War, the nation was very disillusioned. They didn't know who they could believe, they didn't know who, he could tr who they could trust, Ike is that. Ike is an AWOL Marine. He's been involved in, a, in a heart, an operation abroad that has gone awry. He's, he's left uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital, and he is now in Montana working on the pit crew of legendary stuntman Evil Knievel. Uh, and his sister Lucy is 22, and she is an aspiring journalist. She wants to be the next Woodward or Bernstein. Uh, she's working for the Washington Star, and she gets wooed away from the, the Washington Star by this charming, dashing British family that has come to start a new tabloid in Washington, D.C., the Washington Sentinel. This family, the Lyon family, is very directly based on the Murdochs uh, and is very directly about how in 1977, that's the year that tabloid journalism really exploded in the United States. In New York at the time, 1977, that was the summer of Sam. That was the son of Sam serial killer. And that's when the New York Times, and I'm sorry, the New York Post and the New York Daily News really increased circulation and newsstand sales by scaring the bejesus out of New Yorkers with this, you know, by telling the story of this, of this serial killer. And in All the Demons Are Here, uh, the Lyon family wants Lucy to cover a serial killer in DC 
and do the same for their newspaper uh, as the Murdochs are doing for the New York Post with the Son of Sam. So the two stories are about, well, Ike's story is about Evil Knievel and the people who follow Evil Knievel. And that's a, that's a story about Evil Knievel running for president, um, which he actually did in 1972, kind of like a stunt campaign. But in, in, my, in the book, I have him uh, launching a, a more of a serious campaign and leading a bunch of followers across the country, uh, people who have grievances and, and issues with the government. And, um, and, the, and that storyline is about, well, it's about the suspension of, uh, it's about the, the tension of what are they gonna do when they get to the government, when they get to Washington. And it's about followers following a demagogue. And the other story is about the danger of tabloid journalism and, and what it can do when you put uh, sensationalism ahead of facts. Um, so I, in all these books, I try to talk about things going on today through the perspective of things that went on in the past. So uh, you've done, one of the interesting things about your, your works of fiction is they have extensive endnotes. They do have extensive endnotes, and I do that because I'm the kind of person that when I watch uh, a movie based on a real story, I then spend the next two hours on Google um, trying to figure out what's real, what's not real. One of my favorite websites is Holly, His History Versus Hollywood, where they do a lot of that work for you. Uh, and it really, honestly, ruins a lot of movies for you. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you don't want to know what's real and what's not real about Rudy, I won't ruin it for you. But <laughs> suffice it to say, the, the fictional version is a lot more exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm the kind of person that wants to know. And one of the fun things for me is how many people say, I thought you made that up, and actually that's real. And I'm like, yeah, I found that, and that, that was actually real. So one of the things that I found fascinating from the first book, which also had extensive end notes, The Hellfire Club, is that uh, uh, Joe McCarthy, when he was drinking, would eat an entire stick of butter. Yeah. And, and I- True. Right. <laughs> and I found that out through your end notes. Yeah, I read this amazing book by Jack Anderson, the legendary muckraker Jack Anderson, wrote a great biography of, of McCarthy in 1952. Uh, and it had all these amazing details. This is two years before McCarthy was censured, two years before Murrow went after him, et cetera. And it had this amazing detail that he would eat a stick of butter while he drank, which he often did. And uh, uh, it was just so, I mean, who, who does that? It was such a great detail. So uh, what details? Apologies if any of you do that. <laughs> <laughs> what details did you find particularly revelatory as you were researching the times and the people in All the Demons Are Here? I mean, I think the thing that was the most interesting to me about, well, I mean, about Evil, evil Knievel was just such a fascinating character. His, um, his charm completely, I, this is the first uh, of the three books, this is the first uh, era that I was alive for. Uh, I was eight in 1977, so I don't remember most of this. Uh, I remember Elvis dying, and I remember the energy crisis, but I don't remember Studio 54. I don't remember, uh, I do remember Elvis dying, like I said. I don't remember The Son of Sam. I assume my parents turned off the news uh, when I came in the room, um, or whatever, I don't know exactly. but. But um, Evil Knievel, I remember my friends that had the lunchbox, the Evil Knievel lunchbox, and I remember my friends that had the wind-up motorcycle. But I, his charm completely escaped me, uh, even as a, as a five, six, seven-year-old. Um, I was watching, I guess, PBS while my friends were watching <laughs> ABC Wide World of Sports, and so I never <laughs> saw that stuff. But a friend of mine said, you really, um, you got, if you're writing about the 70s, you need to, you need to learn about Evil Knievel. He's, and he was right, because he is this quintessentially American character. Um, showman, uh, P.T. Barnum, there is, you know, there is a Trump-esque quality to him in, in the sense that he is able to, to just play with the media and get them to cover everything he does and shoot from the hip. I, I don't even mean it in a pejorative way, he's just, but he is one of these, these quintessentially American characters that is able to, to get attention and get a following. And um, he, would, he had a cane 
that you, he would unscrew the handle and then he would pour wild turkey from the cane. That was a real thing he had. Um, but the more I read about him, the more it made sense that his life rights, which Hollywood has, you know, different actors have had his life rights for years and nobody has made the Evil Knievel movie. And the more I read about him or, or watched documentaries about him, the more I understood why, which is he's just an awful person, mm. just a horrible, horrible guy, horrible guy. And there's no third act arc. Like he, he doesn't become a different guy at the end of his life. Horrible guy, becomes famous, worse guy, less famous, even worse guy dies. Um, so it makes sense why they couldn't make a movie out of him. Um, but he's great for like a, you know, a foil for my characters to play off of. So I, I guess, but the, the fact that all this stuff happened in 1977 was the weirdest thing for mm. me. Mm. Jimmy Carter's inaugurated, Star Wars, Saturday Night Fever, Studio 54, opens, um, Evil Knievel literally jumps sharks, Fonz eight months later jumps sharks, um, Som Summer of Sam, Rise of Tabloid Journalism, uh, New York City Blackout, I mean just all of and, these. And Elvis died. As you Elvis mentioned. dies, yep. Yep. Um, just one after the other after the other, all in this one year was just really, really bizarre. Before we get off the subject of Evil Knievel, you reminded me in the book that he went to jail. Talk about that. The, 1977 is the year that Evil Knievel's career uh, truly, um, ne it never, he never, it never really recovers um, because he had a PR guy. So his, the, he ends up, in 1974, he's on the cover of Sports Illustrated which is ridiculous because he was not an athlete. Um, you know, he jumped motorcycles over buses, but that's not athletics. Um, but anyway, in 1974, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and Rolling Stone for trying to jump over Snake River Canyon in Idaho. Um, and for those of you who remember, it wasn't even on a motorcycle. It was like in like a rocket ship from like Road, Roadrunner uh, Wile E. Coyote cartoons. Like, <laughs> Ac like Acme made it. <laughs> and it didn't make it across. Like he almost died. It was just ridiculous. And um, so the PR guy he had for that was this guy named Shelly Saltman. And Shelly Saltman was recording everything with like a tape recorder. And um, he wrote a book uh, about Evil Knievel. And it came out in 1977. That's all, that also happened. And, um, and it was, it was his words and, you know, it was, it was, it was Evil Knievel bragging about his extracurricular activities and such and anti-Semitism and, you know, whatever, everything that made Evil Knievel a horrible person. And, uh, Evil Knievel flew to Los Angeles and with a, some thug found Shelley Saltman on some Hollywood lot and with a baseball bat, you know, beat, beat, beat the living tar out of him and then he, he went to jail. <laughs> that was pretty much the end of Evil Knievel's career. Um, it's remarkable. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, and that's toward the end of the book, but, but um, yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah, it, 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 doesn't, really, it doesn't really spoil the book, um, but, but uh, it's just weird um, because People don't even people don't even remember that part of the story, really. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's exactly right. I was reminded of it uh, when I was reading the book. I had totally forgotten that. So you had written three works of nonfiction before you wrote the Hellfire Club. Yeah, I wrote a uh, early in my career. I wrote a quick bi quickie biography of Jesse Ventura right after he was elected governor. I wrote a book about the Florida recount right after that in 2001. And then I wrote a book about Afghanistan called The Outpost that came out in 2012 that they made into a movie that was supposed to debut at South by Southwest in March 2020. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, anyway, and then so people saw it on pay-per-view at home. Why fiction? What was the impetus for you taking up the pen to write fiction. I'd always, wa I'd always been interested in fiction. I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was a, a kid and then in college, and I wrote a novel in my 20s that never got published, but it got me an agent. And 
Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of fiction. It allows you to explore different parts of your brain than nonfiction does. Um, it's completely different. Um, it's, it's, it's more challenging in a lot of ways uh, than, than nonfiction is. Nonfiction's more work uh, in terms of interviews and fact checking and all that. Um, but fiction is more difficult because you have to, you know, you have to make it all up. You have to put the pieces together. Mm. Um, so it, it's, and also just a, it was, it, it was a, a way, it's a more of an escape for me to, from the world of nonfiction that I deal in day in, day out that is generally uh, can be difficult on, I don't want to complain, I have a great job, but like, you know, especially covering, during COVID, for example, it was fun to take an hour and spend it with the Rat Pack for the second book. Right. That was, the second book takes place in DC and Los Angeles with Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and whatever. So that was fun to like, you know, my kids are learning remotely and, uh, at, and uh, I'm covering you know, 50,000 people are now dead. It's, you know, whatever. And like, okay, hold on. And I take an hour and I'm drinking wine with Frank Sinatra. Okay, now I'm back <laughs> in the real world. That was a nice hour. You know what I mean? What was the impetus of these characters? Charlie and Margaret? Mm. Um, I wanted to have it, them be a couple because I feel like I read a lot uh, of books about you know, the single man detective who, you know, like the James Bond type. And I love those books, I read them, I enjoy them. But I'm a happily married guy and I feel like, I like the Nick and Nora books, the Thin Man books also, and those movies. And I thought it'd be fun to have like a couple um, that are in love and it's not just about like sleeping with somebody to get a clue or whatever, like to have them be a unit and have their marriage also be like a character and have the woman also be, you know, a, 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 not just an appendage of her, of her husband, but have her be a strong, if not stronger character mm -hmm. than him. And so for that reason, I, you know, I, I always make sure that I have strong woman editors checking out the book and, you know, because, you know, I want to write books for 2023, not 1952. Mm. And, and uh, actually, I got criticized um, for, my, for the Hellfire Club. The Washington Post reviewer criticized Charlie. They described him as like a, a pink hat wearing, this is, you know, right after the Woman's March. They thought he was too sensitive mm. um, uh, kind of character. But so I don't know if I thought that, but, but uh, I, I did think, I wanted the characters to be, if not, I don't think they were too enlightened, but I wanted them to be in love and I wanted them to be equal. Mm. And I thought that that was important, uh, and because I thought it was different. And also I thought it would be a challenge. And so I did that for the first book and then I did that for the second book. It's not by the way that, it's, that, that they're perfectly, like one of the, one of the two, almost cheats on the other in the first book, and then the other one almost cheats on the other in the second book. Um, they don't, so don't worry. <laughs> Neither of them cheats, but, but, but you know, they're, they're tempted. Um, and then, then, then the next temptation, not the temptation, sorry, the next challenge was in this book, um, instead of writing in third person, I wrote in first person, mm -hmm. and I alternated. I had Lucy tell a story, Lucy writes one chapter, then Ike writes one chapter, and I go back and forth. And so the challenge was, and this was just me seeing if I could do it as a writer, trying to write as one character, trying to write as one character, and can I convincingly write as a 20-year-old Marine, and then in the next chapter write as a 22-year-old woman journalist. And I have editors, and I like make sure that like people are helping me do this. Mm -hmm. And I have a woman editor who's very good and like helped me with Lucy to make sure Lucy sounds like a, you know, she came, she, one time she inserted some clause about cute boots, which is a clause that has never, you know, come, <laughs> come out of my mouth, cute boots. In the same way that I hired this one guy, um, Mark Gardner, who is a motorcycle expert, helped me write the motorcycle sections for Ike because 
I have literally never driven a motorcycle mm. in my life, but Ike is an expert motorcyclist, and there are many scenes in the book that require that you need to believe that Ike knows a lot about motorcycles. You don't have to know anything about motorcycles, but you need to believe Ike does. And I didn't want to be spend the next five years getting angry emails from motorcyclists, which believe me, that happens. Um, <laughs> so I hired this guy. So in the same way, like motorcycle expertise, cute boots, you know, whatever. I hire, I hire editors to help me. The saga goes from, as I mentioned, McCarthy era 1950s, uh, Kennedy era 1960s, the ominous summer of 1977. Can we assume we'll see a sequel in the Reagan 80s? I, I, I want to do one in the 80s, um, I think. I don't know if that's going to be next. I do miss nonfiction. There are a couple ideas I have for books um, that have to do with the military nonfiction books. Um, the Outpost is still the book that I get the most reaction to. And there are a couple stories that are really interesting that I've heard about that I might want to do. Um, one of which has to do with this really interesting story I heard about <clears throat> these prosecutors that it's, can I tell the story? It's just, um, so it starts on a, an Italian yacht, um, an Italian cruise ship in um, 2011 during the Arab Spring. Uh, it's the Arab Spring, so all these um, refugees are fleeing Libya and Tunisia, and all the southern Italian islands are just being swamped with refugees. So Berlusconi is commandeering cruise ships, and on one of these cruise ships one time, uh, taking uh, migrants from Lampedusa Island, which is just the southernmost island, is this Italian you know, Green Beret, and this migrant comes up to him, this five-foot African guy, and says, can I have some water, and gives him some water, and he notices that the five-foot guy has like some bullet wounds on him, and he asks him how he, he got them. <clears throat> and it comes out that the guy's, the guy's well, eventually he's like, well, I got them uh, fighting in Afghanistan. Long story short, he says, well, I'm, you know, I'm in Al-Qaeda. I don't really belong with the riffraff here, with the migrants. I'm a senior member of Al-Qaeda. Eventually, they take him to another room. They start interrogating him. He starts getting mad. Eventually, he starts freaking out. They sedate him. They take him back to the mainland. And then they call the Americans, and they say, this guy says his name is such and such, and he's in Al Qaeda. Do you want him? Because we can only hold him for 30 days. He attacked one of our guards, but that's all we can do. The Americans know the name. They fly to Italy. They confirm it's him. And now they have a clock ticking, because they only have a limited amount of time to prove that he is who he says he is that he killed Americans in this battle in Afghanistan and to be able to prove it in a court of law so that they can convict him and send him to a jail in America. And it's just this race against the clock where they have to get at, fi figure out which battle it was, get evidence, and it's just this fascinating story of like finding a Quran that the st soldiers st stole from a battlefield, getting a taking it to Quantico, and this woman with blue hair gets a fingerprint, and just really interesting stuff. The guy is in a supermax. It's all, it all ends happy, but, but it's just this really interesting tale of sleuthing, um, and also the story of the, the soldiers that, that he killed, and the families finally getting justice, which mm. never happens that somebody who kills soldiers on a battlefield in Afghanistan ends up in a supermax. I mean, that never happens. Right. So anyway, that's just like one story that I heard that I just thought was really interesting. And a very sobering one. And let me share some, I'm going to pivot to your day job, Jake, and, and share some sobering poll numbers from a poll that Gallup did last year relating to Americans' faith in news media, which reveals that 34% of Americans have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence in news media. Uh, the lowest in history in the poll, uh, the history of the poll with the exception of 2016 where it cratered and then went back up. In the same poll, 38% say they have no trust in news media. It's the first time that that number has exceeded those who have at least some trust in news media. Uh, let, let me shed further light on it. 70% of Republicans have no trust in media. 14% of Democrats have no trust in media. So there's great disparity between the parties. How do we make sense of those very sobering statistics? It's not complicated. 
I mean, Donald Trump, the entire, um, not the entire, a, a lot of the Republican Party and the entire right wing ecosystem has been saying since 2015, you can't trust the news media, it's all fake news. That's, I mean, if you turn on Fox or click on Breitbart or, tune, tu or turn on, you know, whatever Donald Trump is saying right now, it's just nonstop, you can't trust the media, you can't trust the media, you can't trust the media. It does, now, if we say some, if I say something that they like, mm. they will repeat it. Um, but, I mean, that, that's the, now, do they do that because they actually think that we're not telling the truth? No. Right. They, Fox does it because it's a business decision. They are trying to discredit us so people watch only and trust only them. Uh, and the, and Donald, I mean, Donald Trump told Leslie Stahl, she said to him, why do you do that? Why do you say that? This is what she says in an interview, like off camera when she was interviewing him, I think in December 2016. Mm -hmm. That's right. Why do you say that? And he says, so when you report something about me I don't like, they don't believe you. It's a preemptive tactic. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. I mean, it was obvious. I mean, that's why he attacks the judicial system. I mean, you know, Liz Cheney, et cetera. So that, so it does, yes, and it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Also, um, there is a great deal of, I think, uh, I think that we, I think there are too many people in the media that fall for the trap of, well, Trump and Fox and them hate us, therefore, we are their opposition. Um, and we should position ourselves that way. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I see myself. Mm. I see lies as our opposition. But if Donald Trump is doing something interesting in ter terms of trying to appeal to automakers, I'm going to report that. I mean, I might say, I might provide the context of what he did or did not do for automakers when he was president. But like, I'm, I'm not opposed to him as a person or his policies per se. I'm certainly opposed to not accepting the results of an election and staging an insurrection, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But like, I have no position on the Abraham Accords or his tax cuts. And I think too many in the media who position themselves as, well, if he is against us, I'm against him, falls into his trap and uh, does some of his job for him, I think. And when you launch a, you know, when you, um, when you're not objective, when you don't try to be fair, mm. then you are helping them make that case against yourself, I think. So how do you see your role? To call balls and strikes, mm -hmm. to stand up against lies, to stand up against indecency, but not, not to advocate for one party or the other. Mm. Not to, you know, I, Chip Roy is a very conservative congressman. He, he comes on my show, he wants to talk about um, the need for this continuing resolution to pass to fund the government. I don't have a position on it. Mm. You know, let me tell you something. The argument that our government uh, spends more money than it takes in is not inaccurate. That's a, fa that's a fact. Mm. We do spend more money than we take in. Now, maybe you think we should take in more and increase taxes. Maybe you think we should spend less. Maybe you think it's a combination of both. Maybe you think deficit spending doesn't matter. I don't know. Those are all positions to take. But it is true that we are spending more uh, in interest on our debt than we are spending on many social programs that would benefit yeah. our kids. Mm. So, I'm not here to advocate against those who want to balance the budget. Mm. I am willing to posit that, okay, how do you want to do it? How do you want to achieve it? I don't think it's a crazy thing to want. Mm. 
And I think that we need, we in the media, need to do a better job of not just automatically assuming if these guys like it, then I've got to hate it. And I think that Trump, first of all, I think that, first of all, Republican suspicion of the, of, of the news media has been going on for generations, mm. right? Decades. I'm old enough to remember George H.W. Bush at a convention, I think in Houston, holding up a bumper sticker that said, annoy the media, vote for Bush, yeah, yeah. right? Wasn't yeah. that here? Where George P. Bush stood up and said, viva Bush? He was like a little chubby kid. Am I wrong? I, I think that's, that sounds right, yes. He's not chubby anymore, don't get me wrong. He was like eight or something, but I'm just saying like. Yeah, he was a little kid, he was the young yeah. grandson of, of yeah. the 41st president, yeah. Um, so, and that's just my memory. Anyway, um, so I mean, that's always been the perception, so it's not like it's new, but the idea of they're not with us, therefore we should not give them interviews, mm. or we should be demonizing them, or we should hate them, or we should be bashing them so much that our supporters are sending pipe bombs to their offices. Yeah. That's where we are now. I mean, literally, he had, there was a Trump super fan in Florida, you remember this, Caesar Sayoc, who was sending pipe bombs to CNN and other places. Yeah. Yeah. And you would think on planet Earth, that might cause somebody to say, maybe, I've, maybe my rhetoric's gotten a little too heated. Mm. But no. So um, I'm not here to say like that that isn't obscene. It is. It's, of course, it's horrible. But I also think that like the disruption that he caused, and he's a disruptor, mm. sometimes for good, often for ill, shouldn't make us lose our equilibrium so much that um, we don't even try to be fair about issues and um, debates and mm -hmm. such. You moved to Washington in 1998, the, the, the tail end of the Clinton administration. Did I move into Washington? No, I moved to Washington in... Is it not 98? No, no, I moved to Washington in 1992. Oh. Yeah, I worked for a member of Congress. I worked for a, a fan. I, I graduated from college, went to film school, hated it, came back home, had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, completely miserable. If there's anybody here who is in college or just out of college, I did not become a full time journalist until I was like 28 or 29. Please do not put pressure on yourself that you have to have everything figured out by 22 or 23. Please do not. Take some time. Please. You will figure it out. You're gonna be okay. Honestly, I swear to God. And there are gonna be people there who are like law school, business school, and you're gonna be like, oh my God, they have everything figured out. And you're gonna be fine. Do not worry. Um, anyway, so I had no idea what I wanted to do. I picked up the paper. A family friend was running for Congress. I called her. She said, come on out. I went out to her house. It was like her, some friend of hers, and me, and we started working on, I started writing position papers hmm. for her. And then she, she, it was the year of the woman. Mm. Uh, and she won. And then I became her press secretary in Washington. And I hated it. And... Um, then I hopped around doing PR, and like in there, I started writing freelance stories. And then somewhere in there, I started doing full-time journalism, like 98. That's where I came into <laughs> So the 98. So OK, here's, here's another tip but that, for young But those, folks. Were those lost years, you're fine to skip over them. I mean, like, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> Another tip for young folks in the audience, if you're doing reporting, if you get into Jake's field and you're a reporter, don't get your facts on Wikipedia. <laughs> Just saying, that's where I got that 98 thing. But, but you started, you, you, you got in the news business News in business, a full-time news, full right. news reporter in 1998 and the, all the previous years, m misery working in p for PR firms and all the like. So you have covered every administration from Clinton forward. Yes. And had a pretty good view of Washington. How has it changed in the course of those 20-plus years? 
Um, well, it was perfectly nasty back in the 90s. Um, like, and I think people act as if it wasn't. Uh, you know, it was super nasty back in the 90s. <clears throat> um, but there was more uh, bipartisan fraternizing, you know, under, you know, uh, at parties and such mm. uh, in the 90s. I would say, like, Trump really, and this is, again, this is not necessarily even a bad thing, but the whole White House Correspondents' Dinner, gridiron, you know, all that stuff, he kind of, just because he didn't want to participate because he felt like he wasn't liked by those people, and he stopped going, and it became kind of less celebratory, which, in honestly, it is, some of those things can be kind of gross um, uh, in, in ways. Um, it's less so now. And maybe, I mean, Obama was kind of peak all of that, mm -hmm. all peak Washington celebration of itself. Um, which, you know, again, I'm saying it's not necessarily a wonderful thing. A lot of people thought it was gross. Um, I mean, there is a degree to which, I'm not, I'm, I didn't come here to praise Donald Trump, but there is a degree to which his hatred of us journalists did kind of like take off some of the more odious edifices of Washington. Like, for instance, I was thinking about this the other day when I was trying to get John Kirby, the White House spokesman, uh, to explain the photograph of Joe Biden smiling at Mohammed bin Salman, um, who, who Biden promised he would make a pariah. Um, and uh, look, I get it. I understand why every president bows to Saudi Arabia. I drive, you know, I get it. <laughs> and I know I'm in Texas, so. Um, but like, to a degree, all Donald Trump was doing when he just like was shamelessly pro-Saudi mm -hmm. and didn't care that they murdered a Washington Post columnist and just, just didn't, to a degree, all he was doing was admitting it. That's what I was thinking when I was interviewing Kirby. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make it good but it kind of exposes the hypocrisy of it all. That we make Joe Biden, we, maybe it's us, maybe it's our fault. We make Joe Biden pretend that he's really gonna get stern with the Saudis. Mm. And then he doesn't get stern with the Saudis, you know? I don't know, I'm sorry to sound so cynical. I'm not, I'm not praising Trump and I'm not blaming Biden. I'm just like, it is, there is just something uh, weird about the, the kabuki that we make presidential candidates go through. Well, let me, let me, when you were here five years ago, you quoted Mark Twain, who said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. You know what? Since then, I have investigated that quote and Mark Twain didn't say it. Wikipedia says he did. He, with, <laughs> no, no, but no one knows who said it. I just said until I right? just, yeah, no one knows who said it. So I, I wish it was Mark Twain, because it's such a great quote. Well, everything else is attributed to Mark Twain, so he gets them all. <laughs> anyway, but it is a great I quote. I said it. Uh, there you, go. you heard me. <laughs> Five years ago on this stage. <laughs> uh, you have helped heavy research of the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s for yeah. your works of fiction. And you've lived in Washington in the 1990s. I sound really cynical the, tonight, the don't I? I'm sorry. I haven't, I, I stopped drinking a few weeks ago. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Does somebody have a stick of butter that he can consume? <laughs> Quick, please. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there any time that you've researched or lived through in the past 70 years that in any way remotely rhymes with the times we're living through right now? All of it rhymes. I mean, the McCarthy era rhymed with Trump because very few people were willing to criticize Joe McCarthy even though they knew he was wrong. Uh, and they all thought somebody else was gonna do it. And the only one who was brave enough, there were very few people who were brave enough to do it. Margaret J. Smith, the great Republican moderate senator from Maine was one of the few. She went to the floor of the Senate and with her declaration of conscience and she called him out 
1950, four years before the, the Senate censured him, four years before the sainted Edward R. Murrow did it, and um, that's what she's remembered for. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that reading about that made me realize, like that is like you don't get to pick what you become remembered for, um, in the sense that, like, I'm sure Robert Taft, the Senate Majority Leader in 1954, when I wrote that book, yeah. I'm sure he thought he was going to be the president someday, or he'll be known for his great foreign policy views, although he's known for being an isolationist, so people think of him negatively. But he was really known for being an isolationist, for losing to Eisenhower, and for, and for being afraid of McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And like, you don't really, and for dropping dead in the Senate, but you don't really get to, um, you don't get to pick the, the, the challenge for which you'll be remembered. And so you might as well just stand for what you believe in because that ultimately might be your moment. We know how Liz Cheney's gonna be remembered. Mm -hmm. We know how Adam Kinzinger is gonna be remembered. Mitt Romney is gonna, we know how Mitt Romney's gonna be remembered. Mm -hmm. And you know, until these recent challenges, he probably would have been remembered for, you know, for flip-flopping on abortion, for, like, for maybe not such positive things. But then came another moment. So Margaret Chase Smith is remembered for what she's remembered, and the people who hid in McCarthy's Washington will be remembered the way they are. And so that was resonant. The Devil May Dance is really more about um, Hollywood sexism than it is about, it's, I mean, to a degree it's about who you, it, who you dance with and who you get in bed with. Second book. That's the second, second book. Second of the It's markets. about, it's about, you know, Kennedy getting in, the Kennedys getting in bed with Sinatra and Sinatra getting in bed with the mob and all of that. But it's really more of a Hollywood story. Uh, and this book is about uh, demagogues and yellow journalism, tabloid journalism, and obviously th it, this was directly written about today. Mm. Um, although, I mean, not, not, you know, not, not with a sledgehammer, but I was definitely thinking more directly about it. Mm. Back in May, uh, CNN did a town hall in New Hampshire uh, with Donald Trump moderated by Caitlin Collins, and it was roundly criticized for offering Trump a platform for his lies and disinformation. Wait, we, we, did, we did what? <laughs> I'm sure I got that one right. Um, but if you were to stage that town hall today, what would you change? So I guess the, the, here are the questions that I would ask about the, the criticism of the town hall. I guess, first of all, there is this, and I really mean this as very sincere questions. Because um, I, I have now done a town hall with Vice President Pence when his book came out last year, and I did a town hall with... Uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley um, in Iowa. And I guess one question I have is, do you think the town hall format and do you think the, the idea of it is a, is, a, is a good thing to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I do. Um, but I can understand people think it's just an advertisement for the candidate or you know, why even do it? Because it's, it's, it is, as a format, it's not the hardest hitting format. Right. Right. It is. If you're doing it, you're doing it. Uh, if if you're if you're Joe Biden, it's Democrats and Democrat leading independents in a, you know in New Hampshire or Iowa or whatever. So it is generally going to be a friendly audience and generally issues that you want to talk about. And maybe I'll follow up here and there, but it's generally going to be not the toughest situation. So that's one. Um, and then then there's the argument, and this is obviously the big the, the big question. Do you treat Donald Trump like you treat any other candidate? Right. And obviously that is a that is an institutional question for any other for any institution, any news organization. And some people say you have to, and some people say you can't. He's not. In terms of the number of falsehoods he tells, in terms of the insurrection he led. Um, and then there is the question of if you do it, how do you do it? Is it live? Mm. Is it on tape? If it's, if it's on tape, do you fact check it? And then there's the question about, uh, I mean, NBC was thoroughly criticized for even just doing an interview with him yeah, yeah. and how they did the interview. Yeah. And I'm amenable to all of these criticisms, and I get it, but I, I just also think the media is in a 
very difficult situation because he is in all likelihood going to be the Republican nominee. Yeah. Yeah. And the polls indicate that it is at the very least going to be a very competitive race. He's going to win this state. That's not even a question. Yeah. Um, and he could very well be elected again. And what is our responsibility? Is our responsibility to deny him a platform mm. at all? Are we supposed to provide him a platform but challenge him aggressively? I mean, these are, none of these are easy questions and answers. Um, so I don't have answers for you. I was not, 100%, I was not involved in any of it other than yeah. after the town hall, Anderson and I co-anchored the response. Oh, yeah. um, I think the world of Caitlin Collins, I think she did an impossible job and she tried to fact check him as much as she could. Um, but that's very, it's very difficult to do. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth uh, mentioned the people that you've just interviewed in the last year and you've interviewed a president or two. Uh, you interviewed Donald Trump several times but not since 2016. What is it like to interview Donald Trump? So the last time I interviewed Donald Trump was I think June of 2016. Mm -hmm. He had, he was um, being sued for the shell game of Trump University. And he had a judge, Judge Curiel, um, and he had the night before our interview um, insulted Judge Curiel in an interview with the Wall Street Journal saying that Judge Curiel couldn't do his job because he was a Mexican. Couldn't be objective. He something? couldn't be, yes, he yeah. couldn't be objective. Yeah as a judge because the Indiana-born Judge Curiel was a Mexican. <laughs> and I saw that, and you know, I had a 30 questions, as I always do, and I thought to myself, this is the most important question I'm gonna ask mm -hmm. him, and I'm not gonna stop until I get an, not until I get an answer, until I get the question out. Because getting the question out with Donald Trump is one of the most challenging things because he does not, he is unrelenting yeah. in his interrupting, in his changing of the subject, in his, I mean, you've never, it is like walking into a tornado. I cannot explain it other than, are Tasmanian devils real? Is that a real thing? Do you have them here? I would think that would be something you would have here. <laughs> It feels like something you would have here. Only is, in the legislature. Is El Chupacabra real? I feel like that would be something you would have here. Anyway, so um, it's just, anyway, the interview's on video. You could find it. But like I, I wanted to say, you said he can't do the job because, he, uh, because he's Mexican. A, he's from Indiana. But OK, he has Mexican heritage. B, if you're saying he can't do the job because of his race, is that not the definition of racism? That was what I wanted to ask. Mm. It took me about 15 minutes to get it out. But I got it out. The interview was on tape. Uh, we aired it. By the way, I mean, they didn't have a, after the interview, it was great. Um, the RNC had, we were in Beverly Hills. <clears throat> the RNC had sent a bunch of um, Chinese-American donors to his house to take pictures of him. And uh, that was a scene. Um, and he kept on calling them Chinese. And they kept on saying, no, we're Chinese-American. And he kept on saying, eh, some of you are Chinese. I'm like, no, we're Chinese-American. <laughs> a few of you are Chinese. No, we're all Chinese. <laughs> it, like, it literally would be illegal for any of them to be Chinese. I mean, because campaign donor, donor laws. Anyway, they were fine with it. They thought it was fine. It was lovely exchange, whatever. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. the truth is, um, in one-on-one -on -one exchanges, he's actually not impervious. I mean, he's, 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 he's fine with, like, tough questions. I mean, he, at least in 2016, he was. But, he, but the thing is, Jake, he obfuscates so adeptly and so relentlessly, to, your, to use the word that you used earlier, I would think that if you continue to ask the question you're desperately trying to ask him, you seem strident. I mean, it, no, it, it, I think he appreciates. Honestly, I, I don't think that he. 
I, I honestly don't, I, like I'm not an expert in the psychology of Donald Trump, but I, I don't think he thought I was strident. I think he just like, he's just, you know, he's just doing his neo mm. things and like, I got there and he said, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's racist. Well, it's gotta be an enormous challenge. But, uh, but anyway, it aired. Yeah. It did not go well for him. And that was the last interview I got with him. Yeah, 2016. 2016. And, and you know, and I think he w would like to do an interview with CNN. Yeah. But I don't, but I've, I've, I don't think he should be able to do one until he does it with me. Yeah. Because now I am, I wasn't then, but now I am the chief DC anchor. And I don't think in the same way that it used to be at NBC for the late, great Tim Rossner, yeah. if you wanted to do an interview as a candidate, you had to go through Big Boy. Sure. And that was Russert. After Russert, you know, you could talk to other people. Right. Now, I'm not Tim Russert, but I am the chief DC anchor, and my opinion is you need to go through me. Sure. So we'll see what happens. So Eric Erickson, the, uh, talk, the conservative talk radio show host, was on your show yesterday, and he said, those who try to imitate Donald Trump wind up losing. In your view, is the MAGA movement about a movement or about a man? What, what happens to MAGA if Donald Trump is no longer leading the charge? It's interesting. I think he has reshaped the Republican Party in some ways. I do think it's true that it, do, it, it is non-transferable. Like, I, I mean, it, he, he's not... Like, it, it, you can't become him. There is something about him that people, his fans, like. Um, I mean, one of the things he did is he changed the electorate. He was able to get people who were low propensity voters to turn out mm -hmm. in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan. And that's remarkable. If you can do that, one of the things Obama did, I'm not comparing Trump and Obama, but one of the things Obama did in Iowa is he got first time voters mm -hmm. to turn out to vote for him in the caucuses. If you can do that, if you can reshape a map, mm. if you can get people, if you can, if you can change the pool of voters, now it's easier to do in a caucus, right? Right. But if you can change the pool, you can really do something. So I think those voters, those low propensity, are less likely to turn out for whoever comes after Trump. Mm. But I also think that there is a, um, he has shifted and changed things in the Republican Party that, um, that aren't, that aren't going to change back. Mm. Some of them very much for bad, and some of them, like I think the nastiness, and I think the, um, what, will most, what I will most politely call nativism. Mm. Um, but I think also some of it n not necessarily for bad, such as I think uh, the... The other side of the more isolationist tendency is the lack of knee-jerk militarism um, in the GOP. It used to be the Republicans always wanted to, it seems, mm. send the Marines. And Democrats, too. Actually, Democrats are more like that now, it seems. So I, I think that's probably a positive. I wonder at one point, it, that will mean that the defen defense budget actually goes down mm -hmm. as opposed to going up. But in any case, that's, you know, I, I think Biden has not taken any of the Trump tariffs on China down. Mm. So the two parties, you know, like he's actually gotten the Republican Party to become more, at least by the union definition, pro-worker. Mm. I mean, so he's changed thinking in the GOP that I don't think is horrible, or at least it's shifted. Mm -hmm. Less Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. in some ways, maybe not on the tax bill, but in, I don't know. There has been a rethinking that I think is interesting. That, but some of the other stuff that goes with it is horrible. 
Biden has been in office for nearly three years, and latest polls show he's at about 41% approval rating among the American people. But interestingly, 53% of the American people disapprove of his job performance. The, he's done more legislatively than perhaps any president since Lyndon Johnson. He is, the economy's on the uptick. Why is he not gaining traction with the American people? Um, I think there are a few reasons. One of them is inflation. And even though inflation is ticking down, uh, it's still up in some important places when it comes to um, groceries, eggs, mm. gas. Um, there is um, a perception in some instances of uh, incompetence, the withdrawal from Afghanistan um, is not going to go down as mm. one of America's greatest strategic moments. Um, but you're right. I mean, just in terms of legislative accomplishments, uh, there have been some significant ones, both ones that were purely partisan mm. and ones that were bipartisan. Um, probably the most since, uh, since LBJ. Why that is, I don't know. I, I mean, I think one of the reasons is we are in a time of division that makes it very difficult for any president to achieve super high approval ratings. Um, and part of that is the silos in which we put ourselves informationally. Uh, and part of that is just kind of the dissatisfaction that people feel about where the country is going. And that's always, that's a perennial problem. Also, you know, until Trump is the nominee, he will not be running against any one individual. Mm. I think until that sorts out, it won't be Biden versus, you know. Right. I mean, theoretically, it still could be Biden versus Nikki Haley. Sure. And in our poll, um, we did a head-to-head -head matchup. This is two weeks ago. Nikki Haley cleans his cloth. Yeah. yeah. But Biden versus any other Republican, it's within the margin of error. So, you know, that electability argument doesn't seem to hold much sway when it comes to voters. Also, by the way, I mean, the, the idea that he's 80 years old, looks every day of it, and um, a majority of the American people, a majority of Democrats, worry that he won't be able to do the job, mm. that he'll be 86 at the end of the next term. Remember, people were worried about Ronald Reagan being able to do the job at what, 72? 77? Well, he, he left office in 70, at 77. Yeah, but people yeah. were talking about how old he was at 72. 69, he came into office, yeah. I mean, holy smokes. Yeah, yeah. 69, that's like a marathon runner. <laughs> I'm serious. 69, Mike Pence is out there talking about how young he is. He's like 66. I'm serious. So, I mean, he's, he seems old, mm -hmm. right? Donald Trump is 77, but he does not seem as old. Now, he might seem a lot of other things to you people, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not, but he doesn't seem any different than he did 10 years ago, necessarily. So Joe Biden has been a fixture in Washington since you moved there back in the 90s. Joe Biden has been a fixture in Washington since I was five. Yes. <laughs> but you've gotten to I'm know I'm not him. exaggerating. Oh. As he would say, I'm not being facetious. 1973. Jack. Comes into Washington as a senator <laughs> in 1973. It's oh, I'm sorry, four. I said I was four. <laughs> so has anything surprised you about the Biden presidency? Um, no, <laughs> not particularly. Um, I, you know, it's weird because he was, he has been there so long. When I started covering politics on a national level in the late 90s, he was regarded, and maybe unfairly so, as kind of a clownish mm. uh, windbag. 
Um, there's a famous story <laughs> um, of Obama, Senator Obama, in a hearing, I think it was a Senate Foreign Relations hearing, listening to somebody speak and writing, <laughs> writing a note to an aide that says, like, shoot me now. <laughs> and it was Biden. It was, it, was, it was Chairman Biden, I believe, was speaking. And he was known as a, as a you know, a glad-handing, like, old Irish, patch on the back, windbag. Um, and supercilious and self-important. And what's interesting is how much he has reinvented that image, first through the vice presidency. Mm. Well, for, I mean, a lot of, for a lot of people, he hasn't reinvented that image. Let's, uh, let's be honest. I mean, a lot of Republicans still see him as that. Um, but, you know, he became uh, kind of the indispensable vice president in many ways during the, 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 pre the, the Obama presidency and then, you know, the savior mm. of the Democratic Party. And it really is still remarkable how that whole nomination thing happened. He got clocked in Iowa, clobbered New Hampshire, he won South Carolina, and then all of a sudden everybody dropped out except for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> there was some maneuvering behind the scenes there that we still have not learned about. Somebody's going to win a Pulitzer someday for like telling us about what happened there. Like all of a sudden everybody who won the other two contests dropped out. Okay, anyway, um, he, uh, he is a tough Washington operator. And one of the things that is most interesting about him is this avuncular Grandpa Joe, Uncle Joe image, mm. which I think in, you know, I think he's very sincere <clears throat> when he meets people who have suffered grief about dealing with them because that's an issue that he knows about. Sure. Um, but he is tough behind the scenes. He's a tough guy. Like cold hearted. I'm not this is not meant as a criticism. That's the job. You need to be that for that job. I don't think anyone who's had that job uh, has not been that. Maybe Jimmy Carter, right? Um, and uh, that's interesting. I think he has a real blind spot, and perhaps understandably so, when it comes to his family, and I think that's a real problem. Um, when it comes to his brothers and his son making money off the Biden name, and maybe there's nothing illegal about it, mm. <clears throat> but it sure stinks. We what? are. Yeah, that stinks too. Jared yep, Jared Kushner, that stinks even. Two billion dollars, absolutely, yep. stinker Rooney. Yeah. Yeah. More on that, okay. <laughs> I have reported on it. I have reported on it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, yes. See, this is, I mean, uh, the idea that I haven't reported on it is not, it's not accurate. I have reported on it. Jared Kushner was Donald Trump's emissary to MBS, uh, convinced, well, I don't, even, I don't know if Trump needed any convincing, but they did nothing against the Saudis. And then he gets out of office and uh, goes and gets $2 billion from the Saudis. Mm. I've asked Chris Christie about it on air. I've asked the Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer about it on air. And he agreed on air that he didn't think it was ethical and he had a problem with it. I mean, I do cover it. Maybe watch it, clip it, post it, retweet it. How about that? <laughs> That's an idea. I mean, I do. I do cover it. I will continue to cover it. There is great concern, understandably, in this country about the state of our democracy. What concerns you most when you look at democracy in, a, in America today and its, uh, uh, in its current state? The degree to which there is a sizable group of Americans who don't believe in the rule of law when it comes to elections. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's terrifying. And 
Thankfully, so far, the rule of law has prevailed, but I don't know how long that's gonna last. Mm. Adam Kinzinger said to me one time, we did a documentary called Trumping Democracy. Um, this is before the January 6 hearings. And uh, Adam Kinzinger said to me, you know, you have a guardrail on a highway and you see where a car has hit it. Mm. And you're like, thank God that guardrail was there. But what about the next time a car hits that guardrail? How long is that guardrail gonna la yeah. you know, last? And I worry, yes, the voters uniformly in the battleground states, in Pennsylvania and in Michigan and in Arizona and in Georgia, went to the ballot box and voted against the election liars. Mm. And thank God. Um, and I'm not talking about Democrat versus Republican, I don't care, but like Brad Raffensperger stood the line, right? Mm -hmm. Conservative Republican, stood the line, he's, you know, I, so I'm, this isn't partisan. Um, but, I mean, it isn't entirely partisan, I should say. Um, but there's a, but there is an, there is an, a, there is a, I don't know if author authoritarian is the word, it feels right. Mm. But there is an anti-democratic, anti-rule of law movement in this country to believe deranged lies about the election in an effort to subvert the will of the people. Mm. And I never thought I'd, I'd never imagined we'd see anything like that. Mm. We, come from a, we come from a tradition of where people contest elections and then ultimately they concede. Peaceful the peace. idea that anybody is comparing this to Bush v. Gore is so crazy. Yeah. I've listened to some focus groups the other day. Uh, this woman, do you know Sarah Longwell? She does these, um, she's with this um, Republican <coughs> uh, group called The Bulwark. Um, they're like anti-Trump Republicans. And she does these focus groups, they're really interesting, and she did some um, with double, Trump, people who voted for Trump twice. And she checked in on them to see what they thought about, the, you know, this case and that case and this case and that case. Anyway, when it came to the January 6th case, some woman said something about, oh, it's just like Bush v. Gore. It's, it's nothing like Bush mm, v. Gore. Right, right. I mean, it'd be like Bush, Bush v. Gore. It would be like Bush v. Gore, kind of, if on December 17th, Trump had said, okay, I lost. Then it would, except, you know, in six states, not one, but like, then it would have been something like it. Okay, we challenged it legally and we lost all our cases except one and whatever. But no, it's not like that at all. And the degree to which people are just gonna repeat talking points, believe lies, and there is a chunk of the country that not only, a chunk of office holders, people who know better, mm. who enable it, the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the House voted after January 6th, yeah. when their bodies, the dead bodies were still warm, to disenfranchise the voters of Pennsylvania and Arizona. Yeah. The Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader, and the woman who ultimately became the, the conference leader, although Liz Cheney at the time was, she did not vote that way. So that concerns me. Mm. That is, the, the, without question, nothing comes close to the greatest threat to democracy in the country right now. I'm concerned about the way we silo ourselves off. I'm concerned about the way we, what about everything? Mm. We heard some of that tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to think that, what? I'm allowed to think that sleaze is sleaze. And I'm allowed to not like it regardless of party. That's my job. Let me, uh, let me quote your broadcast news predecessor, Edward R. Murrow, who said in repudiation to McCarthyism in, uh, in the mid-1950s, this is no time for men who oppose Senator McCarthy's methods to keep silent. Right. We can deny our heritage and our history, but we cannot escape responsibility for the result. Has the fourth estate on balance 
been responsible in its coverage on recent developments that have been threatening to our democracy? Yes, but I, am, I, I see too much uh, creeping in of the desire to, it, let me just make it clear, it's not fun to, um, to stand, it's not fun to like call things lies. It's not fun to, it's not fun in front of this audience to like say Hunter Biden's business deals are sleazy. I know that's not gonna win over the crowd. Um, it's not fun to, to it, that's, mm. I saw a headline in USA Today the other day that was so, that worried me so much. It was about like a majority of Republicans believe Trump's concerns about rigged elections or something like that, framed in such a way as to allow for the possibility that maybe the elections are rigged. And I, I just thought every single person waking up in a Holiday Inn is going to read that <laughs> and think maybe, maybe the elections are rigged. Mm. I, I don't mean to be snarky about the Holiday Inn thing, but that's mainly where I see USA Today's. But, but, but no, but seriously, the idea that Trump's, you know, that Trump's concerns about elections being rigged, that's not what they are. Mm. Mm -hmm. Trump's lies about the election. I mean, this, this is not opinion. This has been adjudicated. Even his own Supreme Court wouldn't even look at the cases. His Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. Wade mm. wouldn't even look at the cases. His judges, I mean, so the idea that people in the news media are not willing to call it a lie worries me. Mm. Because when that happens, journalists are like, you ever, you guys, this must be something that happens a lot in Texas. You ever see like a beautiful flock of birds at a distance and they're just all flying one way and then for some reason they all just start flying the other way and then you don't even know why, it's just like one bird just decides, oh, I'm just gonna, and they all just start following. Like, that's what we're like. And if, if all of it, like if every bird starts flying, like, you know, we're just all gonna start pretending that the elections were, you know, I mean, it's just a debate. Maybe they were rigged. Mm. How do you explain whatever? I worry that so many people in the media are gonna start doing that. Mm. And that terrifies me. It really does. Look at what Fox did. They were so worried about losing viewers. Mm. They, they lied to their audience in a way <clears throat> that they knew, they knew they were lying. Um, and that, you know, because they were worried about losing millions of dollars. Sure. So I'm really, that really terrifies me. It really does. There's so much money at stake and there's so many powerful people invested in this lie. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, and you have, and, we're, and, we're, and we keep losing people that are willing to stand up against it. Like there was, like Liz Cheney's gone, Kinzinger's gone. What Republican in the House stand up. is willing to stand up against it? I mean, seriously, name, name a House Republican currently in office who is willing to stand up and say, I don't believe any of these election lies. I, I'm, maybe there is one, I can't think of one. Peter Meyer from Michigan, he lost his, he lost his seat. Yeah. We, we, he was, defeat, was he defeated in the primary? Yeah. 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 Ken Buck in Colorado, I forget if he's, I, for, I mean, he's been showing a lot of spine on some, a lot of stuff, on like the Hunter Biden stuff, but I forget. I forget if, where he is on that stuff, but that's a good note, I, maybe. And then Mitt Romney's retiring. And so I just don't know who's left. Mm. 
I know Republicans, House Republicans, who don't believe the lies, but they just want to keep their head down and do their job because they believe that they can do a better job on this issue, whatever their focus is, keeping Republicans focused on this other thing, as long as they don't poke their head up on Trump uh, and get primaried and lose their job. And I understand that argument. Yeah. I really do. Because look at Liz Cheney and look at Jeff Flake and look at Bob Corker. I mean, I get it, but it's just terrifying. I mean, look at what happened here with uh, your attorney general. Well, it's not like there was any evidence. <laughs> How many of you have a burner phone? <laughs> Jake, we hope you keep calling balls and strikes. Thank you. Uh, and we thank you for what you do. The book is All the Demons Are Here, and our guest tonight has been the great Jake Tapper. Jake, thanks thank so you. much. Come back. Come back. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will.